Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Kevin Russell. He's going to talk about Willie Nelson, Jerry Jeff Walker, and a whole lot of other fun stuff. Yeah, I kind of met Willie. I mean, not in a personal sitting right across from me sort of way. Uh, I've never tried really that hard to meet him. I'm a little bit, um, I don't know, I'm a little bit like standoffish about, I don't want to bother famous people. But uh, but but played with him and, and you know, I was on the stage with him earlier this year down at Luck Texas and he was so yeah he was like for you know three feet away from me doing uh, uncloudy day or some shit uh, it was a great time it was his birthday time of year so uh, well I was born in Texas I did live in I did live in Louisiana and Shreveport's my other hometown but I was born in Beaumont Texas Southeast Texas and Houston lived in Houston for a long time my dad was back and forth Texas Louisiana. For his uh his business you know so but uh i mean yeah willie always lived large of course and that was austin music so when i was a kid my uncle would play me jerry jeff you know willie and waylon and talk about these guys are in austin and blah 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 and the music was cool you know and uh yeah so i always knew i was going to go to austin and play music that was the dream but it just took me a little while to get there. But yeah, Jerry Jeff was different. He was very different. I mean, he did whatever he wanted. I mean, he he wasn't trying to do anything. He just did whatever he freaking felt mm -hmm. like. <laughs> and I love that. I think he became something else. He became, during his lifetime, he became a living legend. And then he became a little bit uh, just sort of imitating himself, which happens to a lot of those iconic people like that. It just happens, you know. Uh, you be, you're inhabiting this character for so long, then you just start imitating the character, whether it's honest or not. <laughs> yeah, for good reason. <laughs> did, you, did you cross paths with him at all? Yeah, I met him at a hardly strictly bluegrass festival once. The Gords were playing. It was kind of an Austin stage. It was us, Jerry Jeff, Bad Livers, and uh, gosh, I can't remember who else. There was it was all great bands. And we're all backstage. And so I knew all those guys. I'd never met Jerry Jeff before. It was the weirdest thing. He was like standing there with this, those little thin body, thin body acoustics like Kramer made them or something. They're really cheesy. They have a little cut of like the ugliest. Sort of like a, look like a cheesy Walmart Telecaster, but acoustic. And he, he's standing there with it. And, uh, and I, and I just walk up to him and I said, this is my chance to meet him. You know, I was like, hey, Jerry Jeff, you know, blah, blah. And he's like, hey. And he looked a little bit lost. He's like, could you help me tune my guitar? And I was like, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I tuned his guitar for him. And uh, he was very thankful. But, you know, not, not all there, really. He was a little bit distracted, I think. And he was about to go on, so. But, and he really was having a hard time talking, and it was, I was a little bit like, oh, wow. Hmm. He's, he's, he's going through some stuff, you know, and uh, it surprised me. I didn't expect that. Then the dude got on stage, and he just ripped it. He sang the songs perfect, just knew it front and back. He was great. I was like, wow. I was like a different guy up there. So I don't know if he was putting on an act and messing with me, but probably not. Probably just he has that, the uh, just the muscle memory, and it just comes back to you when you're on stage. It just happens, and the same thing. We used to play these parties out in West Texas for this rich oil guy uh, named Clayton Williams, uh, ran for governor of Texas once. Get Dan Richards in the early nineties, and so uh, his uh, his daughter uh, Chim was a big fan of the Gourds, and would hire us for parties. Clayton had these big to do's and he'd have a big star out there every year. Like, and so this one year he had Glenn Campbell and this was right before, uh, they announced that he had dementia. Uh, and so we were watching Glenn Campbell sound check out there and his daughter was in the band and she was crying. It was like uh, something was going on on the stage. We couldn't figure out what it was. And he was saying funny things. Like it sounded like he was joking. But she she wasn't taking it as a joke, and we were we were the guards. We were like, "What is happening?" You know. And then it became clear, like he doesn't know who she is. He's 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 out of it. But then he'd play a song like Galveston, and he'd play it perfectly. It was beautiful. 
And but then he would go afterwards. He would start talking gibberish, and he was lost. And then it was like I don't know. A month after that, they announced you know it was his last tour, and he he had been diagnosed with was Alzheimer's dementia of some kind. So yeah, it was wild. But it it really I've heard stories like that before with artists where they can't put two thoughts together, but they can play the songs perfectly. I don't know, generally in Austin's culture now, I don't know if Jerry Jeff looms as large a figure as, uh, say, Willie Nelson still does. Um, but I think it's still significant to a lot of people in Texas. In the central Texas, the hill country, and out, out around Lukenbach for sure, you know, Lukenbach is a little bit under under siege as, as the hill country grows. You know, it's becoming a desirable place, or it is a desirable place to live. And there's freaking uh, wine places everywhere, and it's just like it's <laughs> tourist tourist haven. It's just, everybody loves it out there. So Lugenbach, now there's some resort supposedly going in n near Lugenbach, and it's going to call itself the Lugenbach something resort. And there's legal discussion like, well, who owns that name, and can anybody use that name, and what's it going to do to... The actual Lugenbach, there's a lot of worry and hand wringing about that. So when some when someone's doing something cool and organic, they don't often think to trademark the name. No, <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> they don't. If they the, don't. If someone thinks to trademark it, it's probably not something very cool. To do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, Hondo was a pretty savvy guy. He just I don't know if he I guess he didn't really I don't know, maybe it wasn't legal for him to trademark the name. I don't know. It's hard to say. But he was a pretty savvy dude. So I'm just being a jackass. No, I know. Okay. No, but that's really true. It's like it's it's often what happens. <laughs> did you did you know him very well, Hondo? No, I never met him. He 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 I think he had passed before I ever got out that way, but uh but my father in law knew him and knows that family real well. We have a ranch. Uh, my wife's family uh, has a ranch out out there, and they all know each other. They're all those families. Um, so I've got lots of stories, you know. And uh, um, some of his family, they still come to shows. Like they don't come to every Luke and Box show, but they usually come to our Luke and Box shows. Uh, and it's a fun place to play. I love it out there. It's great. It's great to be part of that that story, you know. Do you feel like an ambassador as you travel around? I think more in the Gourds days I did feel like a more of a Texas ambassador. And these days I don't really feel so much. Because I am kind of Texas, Louisiana, I've, I've embraced more of my Louisiana side. And people are always confused if I come from New Orleans or where am I, where are you from? You know, and I was like, well, I'm from the Gulf Coast. <laughs> you know, to me it's like that stretch. I'm from the Gulf Coast. Like. I'm from the Gulf Coast. <laughs> I mean, a bull in a china shop. But yeah, from like New Orleans to San Antonio, that crescent of like, that's just, that's my whole cultural cultural world. Like the food, the music, the people, it's the politics, the, the stories. Uh, it's just an amazing history. And, and it really is like Doug, you know, Doug Som was a swamp pop singer from San Antonio. And that everybody did that kind of stuff, and a lot of the early San Antonio sound is really just swamp pop with an accordion. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people might disagree with me on that, but a lot of it became like this this amalgamation of like the swamp pop and the Tex Mex thing. It was brilliant, and it, I guess you got to give Doug some credit for that because that's his world. Um, yeah, but that whole culture from there, the New Orleans, San Antonio, to me is like that's a really important part of my my dna for people that don't know what's swamp pop yeah it's hard to describe it was it was a, it came to popularity i mean it was southeast texas southwest louisiana this is they're separated by state border but they're the same culture really same people and of course they're going to disagree with me if, if they could right now you'd see a lot of comments disagreeing with me oh no we ain't nothing like those texans yes yeah, so <laughs> no they're exactly the same. Uh, and yeah, so it's just a great, uh, it's basically what I think it was, was all these guys, these Louisiana guys, uh, Cajun guys who are like, 
trying to play R&B, New Orleans R&B, which was very popular music, <laughs> incredible music, some of the best ever made. And they, but they didn't have the chops of the New Orleans guys. I mean, they were croon, doing a lot of crooning. Their singing was more crooning, which was popular in the 50s. And uh, yeah, late 50s, early 60s was the heyday. And it was all these great bands and there were tons of dance halls over there. Uh, my mom tells me stories about her and my dad when they were kids going across the border. They weren't supposed to, but it was still, you know, you'd go across the border to these clubs over there. And that's where all these swamp pop bands were playing. And, uh, and I didn't know much about swamp pop growing up. I mean, I didn't know anything about it because we were church of Christ. You know, we didn't do anything. We didn't go anywhere. There were no instruments allowed. It was shape note singing. <clears throat> So it was like, I didn't know anything about that. My friends are like, did you ever go to here or here? You know, and all my Belmont friends. And I was like, no, no, man, I didn't go anywhere. We didn't go, <laughs> went to the mall. <laughs> <laughs> so it was much later, like these Houston guys, um, this guy, Clint Broussard, has a radio show down in KPFT in Houston. Um, he, he started coming to my Houston shows and uh, a couple other guys, music writers in Austin, I mean, in Houston. And they were like, you, do you know you you know Swamp Pop? And I was like, nah, I don't really know. I've heard of that. What I don't really. And they played me some of the songs. I was like, oh well, I've heard like Breaking Up is hard to do. I had heard all these songs, you know, but I didn't know it was called something. I was just those those guys, you know, that do that. And so uh, it was dance music for the. That's what it was, and and uh, and some some people had some big national hits out of that, out of these little. Uh, Little, they were out these little recording studios down there. A lot of them were recorded in Houston at, at uh, what what became Sugar Hill Studios. Uh, and uh, there was a bunch of stuff recorded in Beaumont, Houston, New Orleans. And uh, it was a happening scene from everything I've read back then. You know, so I loved regional music like that. And so that was kind of my... Template. I was like with Shiny Ribs. I I didn't want to tour nationally anymore. I was like, I'm gonna try and just create a regional thing, but do it whatever, do it my way with my music, not a bunch of covers. I mean, I'll do some covers, you know, but so I can just mix up all of this music that I love and it's, it's Gulf Coast influenced and created a regional thing. So that's what I set about to do after the Gourds because I, I was kind of tour done touring as much as the Gords had toured. I didn't want to tour like that anymore. And nationally, I was, wasn't interested in being a national act anymore. <laughs> and, and it worked, you know, worked pretty well. <laughs> Monday night in Wichita. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, that's not that far from you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's true though. But like now, I mean, I have done that. I've, I can go any, I can go to a lot of these little towns and I, I can draw a full house in these little towns and Gords could never do that. You know, so I feel like I cracked some code. And I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> this is something, if you want to expound upon this, this is something I preach a lot on this channel to where if you want to, you know, if you don't live near a grocery store, yeah, you need to plant a garden. Right. And you can create whatever your own version of success mm -hmm. might be in exactly. your own terms. Oh, yeah. Well, I've always been a DIY guy. I want to do it myself. I'm a nonconformist. I'm not a joiner of any kind. <laughs> so when you're that kind of personality, you've got to create it yourself and you have to have find your people to create it with. And that's always what I've been doing from my high school days in Shreveport. When I was in Shreveport, um, we tried to create a little scene. We found every cool little punk rock band. If we heard some cool band, we, we want to be friends with them and let's, let's do shows together and it was all, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, we were just making it up, learning as we went. And that's kind of how I've always been. I, that's why I, I feel like in the, uh, the changes in the music business, my, my model hasn't changed much. It's like, it's, my, my gravy is live performance. It's always been, always will be. Um, I love recording, I love making records and sharing music that way. But that's never been my bread and butter. And I never wanted to be on a big label, I did a lot of work with labels and honestly, a lot of record labels, they, they just tell you whatever you want to hear. They're a lot like the bus lines, you know, they tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> we all got stars in our eyes, you know, and they see those stars and they're like, Oh, we got this one. 
I don't think they're that cynical, but they do mean well, and they want to help you a lot of times. But sometimes it's just... And then there's not, you know, competency is not rampant in the music industry. Well, I got into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you do create your own reality. I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. Create your own world. You know, don't 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 bother trying to be whatever you want to be famous and you want to be part of this giant pop world like I, that's some people can do that and that's great but you don't have to do that and you can create i've created a, i've had an amazing life i mean really it's an incredible life i've led and i did it because i was just stubborn it's just i'm gonna do this you know my parents tried to talk me out of it when i was a kid a lot of people tried to talk i tried to talk myself out of it <laughs> i'm just that stubborn <laughs> Last night in the hot bus. Looking in the mirror. What is wrong with you, mister? 